Okay, hello everybody, welcome, welcome. I appreciate y'all taking the time. This is a press briefing with the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice hosted by the Center for Cooperative Media. My name is Joe Amditas. As you saw recently, we are gonna be recording this session. So uh, you, if you have to step out early or if you miss part of it, we'll make sure to send the recording along after uh, the session is concluded and Zoom has had time to process the recording. We're also gonna be sending out a transcript. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and enable live closed captioning at the moment. If you don't wanna see these or if they're distracting, uh, you can click the live transcript transcript button at the bottom and say hide uh, uh, hide subtitles. Um, today we're joined by uh, two guests, um, but, but first I'm going to go over a little bit of the tech stuff that we're going to be doing today. Some of you have been here before, some of you this is your first time, but for those who are unfamiliar with Zoom after two and a half years of the pandemic, I'll go ahead and go over how we're going to interact today. Um, as you know, we have the chat function. Make sure when you're sending chats or, or messages or questions in the chat um, that you're sending them to everyone. You can make sure you're sending it to the right person by clicking the little drop down next to the two and the colon. Um, make sure you're getting it to the right person. Um, is As we go through, we're going to start by having our speakers present for roughly 20 minutes about the new report that they've produced uh, on the racial wealth gap in New Jersey. Um, please put your questions in the chat, but also um, if you'd like to ask a question in our Q&A period after they're done speaking, you, know, you can use the little re raise your hand function. You click on the reactions button and click raise your hand and you'll see your name will float to the top of the participants list and I'll know that uh, you'd like to speak out loud and at which point I I will spotlight you and uh, you can go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and speak. Um, I am going to try to make sure that we get to the questions in the chat and the people raising their hand in the order that we receive them. So we're going to try to be as fair as possible there. But if I miss you, if I skip over you, just send me a DM or just post in the chat say, hey, you know, hey, Dirk, you, uh, you, you skipped over my question uh, and we'll make sure to float you to the top. Um, I'm going to go ahead and step aside now and I'm going to bring Andrea McChristian up here. Andrea uh, is going to introduce uh, the report and tell us a little bit about uh, what you what we've found. Okay. All right. Andrea, thank take you it so away. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Joe, for the introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you so much to the center for allowing us to present on this great new report today. Again, my name is Andrew McChristian. I'm the Law and Policy Director at the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. For those of you unfamiliar with us, we are a legal policy and advocacy organization based in the mighty city of Newark, New Jersey. And our work focuses on three interconnected pillars, economic justice, democracy and justice, and criminal justice reform, which we'll talk about today. And so to get us started, I'm going to frame um, our wonderful new report um, written by our primary author, Laura Sullivan, who you'll hear from in just a few minutes with an overview of the Institute's 2021 through 2022 priority racial justice agenda. So I'm just going to go ahead and share my screen here. Great. So currently we stand in a very powerful moment in time. As we saw the racial reckoning of 20, summer 2020 sparked by the murder of George Floyd really caused America to take a cold hard look at how structural racism is baked into the very foundation of our nation. And here in New Jersey, we are no strangers to racial disparities and racial inequity. As you'll see from the staircase of racial inequity that we created here at the Institute, my colleague Jake, that shows how New Jersey is home to some of the worst racial disparities in the nation. As you'll see, we have the ratio, the highest disparity um, rate between black to white infant mortality in the nation. We have the highest black to white youth incarceration and adult incarceration disparity rates in the nation. We're the sixth most segregated state in the country for black students. And as my colleague, Laura Sullivan, will go into in just a few minutes, we're also home to one of the nation's starkest racial wealth gaps. And these racial disparities were exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, which as we know has changed how our nation and our world ha has existed. New Jersey has consistently had one of the highest death rates in the nation from COVID-19 since the start of the pandemic. And we all know that COVID-19 has also disproportionately harmed communities of color. In 2020, COVID-19 was the leading cause of death for New Jersey's black residents who are also disproportionately going to be in 
unsafe housing, overcrowded housing, frontline essential workers have less access to health care, all making um, a horrible, a horrible situation um, caused worse by COVID-19. And so out of this kind of duality of this racial reckoning that was jumped off by 2020, which we want to be clear was the start of a movement and not a moment, plus the disparate impact of COVID-19 in our communities of color, we sprang into action to make sure that we were both responsive to what was happening and also responsive to people who for the first time were saying, how can I affect racial and social justice in my community? And we wanted to make sure that we didn't go and just put hashtags up or say empty platitudes, but that we were able to create tangible action items grounded in policy that could make Black Lives Matter in New Jersey. And so out of that, we created our 2021 2022 agenda to make Black lives really matter in New Jersey, which I know was shared with you and is also available on our website. And it listed out a number of policies that we in the Institute have been advancing last year and this year to make sure that Black lives matter in the state. It includes closing the racial wealth gap, which my colleague Laura Sullivan will speak to. It includes transforming the youth justice system which includes our, camp, our 150 years is enough campaign to close New Jersey's youth prisons and reinvest funds into communities, as well as importing accountability into policing and developing community-based public safety options. It looks at to ensuring democracy for all, which would continue upon our campaign, our 1844 No More campaign, which restored the right to vote to 83,000 people on probation and parole by looking to make sure that people who are currently incarcerated also have that right restored and a number of other democracy actions. And also the overall encompassing theme of repairing the harm of divestment from New Jersey's black communities, which speaks to generational harms dating all the way back to New Jersey's tenure as a slave state of the North. And so I wanna lift up just from a few of our different pillars, some of the successes we've already been able to have in our action agenda just over the past, the past year and leading into 2022. Through our advocacy, you'll see on the left-hand side, we were able um, to successfully advocate for New Jersey to bring an early voting regime uh, for the first time in the state's history. And we also worked with churches all throughout the state to have New Jersey engage in its first souls to the polls effort, which I'm sure many of you know is a time-honored tradition of congregants going from church to vote on election day. In addition, we have we were involved very deeply and continue to be involved deeply in monitoring um, what's going on in the redistricting process as part of Fair Districts New Jersey Coalition. And we really took a leading role in making sure racial equity was imbued in the redistricting process, both through our own testimony, legal analysis, and community engagement, and drawing of a unity map with the Fair Districts New Jersey Coalition. In addition, we were also successfully able um, to get past legislation that would limit police presence at polling locations. Uh, we, and this was done in direct response to what we were hearing from community members on the ground who said that kind of after the racial reckoning of 2020, they felt unsafe having law enforcement at the polling locations and in some cases were turned away um, emotionally from polling locations because of law enforcement presence. And so we're very excited um, that that bill is now the law of the land. Within our criminal justice pillar of work, we've also had successes. As I mentioned, we have an 150 years is enough youth justice campaign aimed to close New Jersey's youth prisons and reinvest meaningfully into community-based programs. And in response to COVID-19, our coalition really sprung into action to make sure our vulnerable youth incarcerated in our state's youth prisons were protected. First, our advocacy led to New Jersey becoming the first state in the nation to test all of its incarcerated youth for COVID-19. Then we worked with a large coalition of advocates to ensure that over 100 young people with less than a year left on their sentences were released in response to the COVID-19 crisis. And kind of the last cherry on the top of that rapid response to COVID-19, we successfully advocated for New Jersey to appropriate $8.4 million for the development of youth restorative justice hubs in four pilot cities devastated by youth incarceration to both provide wraparound services for the young people now coming home from the youth prisons, as well as young people in the community to make sure they never enter the youth justice system in the first place. And you'll see that article on the left-hand side. Turning towards our police accountability um, body of work, 
Many of us would not even have known the name George Floyd if not for the bravery of 17-year-old Darnella Frazier, the teenager who recorded this horrible act of violence. And so here in New Jersey, we partnered with the New Jersey ACLU to write a policy brief um, that outlined why New Jersey needed an attorney general directive to protect civilians' First Amendment rights to record police officer interactions, because we want to make sure that people's First Amendment rights are respected in that if there are any incidents that take place, they know what their rights, and importantly, law enforcement knows what their rights are to be reported. And so we were very glad that we were able to work with the uh, Attorney General's office on the right to have New Jersey issue a First Amendment directive in December of last year doing just that. And last, before I turn it to Laura, we've also had several successes within our economic justice pillar of work. As you'll see on the left, uh, we advocated for New Jersey kind of at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic to release date, racial data um, on COVID-19, demographic data, racial ethnicity data. And we were successfully able to advocate for that, which is now available on the state website. In addition, we, we know that as Laura will attest to, student loans um, and the disproportionate impact of student loans on students of color is a factor contributing to our racial wealth gap. And so the first thing that we need to understand is the level of this issue in New Jersey. And so we were able to successfully advocate for passage of legislation that would have New Jersey release student loan data by a number of demographic factors, including race, um, ethnicity, and first generation status. And so I'm excited to now turn it over uh, to my colleague, Laura Sullivan, primary author of our new report, Making the Two New Jerseys One, to discuss those, that report's findings. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Andrea. I'm uh, pleased to be able to talk about our report. I am also going to share my screen, so hold on just one moment. Okay. Can you all see my, my slides now? Yes, we can yeah. see it. Great. Okay, so um, I am here today, as Andrea noted, uh, to talk about our new report, Making the Two New Jerseys One, Closing the $300,000 Racial Wealth Gap in the Garden State. And again, my name is Laura Sullivan. I'm the Director of Economic Justice here at the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. So our report, which was released uh, last week, really highlights the fact that there are two New Jerseys. In one New Jersey, um, we have uh, disproportionately black and brown residents where fa families are struggling to make ends meet in one of the most expensive states in the nation. But we are one of the most prosperous states in the nation with one of the, some of, characterized by some of the starkest racial and economic inequities in the country. So in one New Jersey, where we have, again, disproportionately black and brown residents and families are struggling to make, make ends meet, we have about 20% of families with incomes below $35,000. In the other New Jersey, which is predominantly white families, families have wealth for long-term security to invest in homes, to invest uh, in the future of their children. In that New Jersey, about 15% of families have incomes over $200,000. So just as Martin Luther King Jr. identified the two Americas over 50 years ago, today New Jersey is a microcosm of that idea, characterized by two economic extremes. So our report highlights the reality that we're in today, uh, particularly focusing on the racial wealth gap and talks about solutions to address those inequities that we see today. So where are we today? This is the racial wealth gap in New Jersey compared to the racial wealth gap nationally. So nationally, the racial wealth gap is stark, very extreme at $160,000. But in New Jersey, our racial wealth gap is almost twice that amount at $300,000. So we have one of the highest racial wealth gaps in the nation, which is particularly pronounced because of the high median wealth of white families in our state. So again, we're a very prosperous state, but that prosperity is not being shared equitably. 28% of black households in New Jersey from our analysis have no wealth or more assets than debt, so actually negative net worth. And so almost a third of black families have no assets to turn to in times of need or when they're experiencing income volatility. And our report really highlights the fact that these disparities are not an accident. We got here by design. We got here, we got to this racial wealth gap that we see today through public policies 
um, that provided opportunities for wealth building predominantly for white families um, while creating real barriers to similar opportunities uh, for black families and other families of color. So as Andrea mentioned, starting with uh, the founding of our state um, with slavery as the slave state of the North through the 20th century, our report uh, erasing New Jersey's red lines really highlights this history in more detail. Um, that report came out about two years ago. And we talk about in that report how from uh, in the, or the early years in, in slavery to the 20th century um, with redlining, racially restrictive covenants and barriers to the uh, access to the GI Bill for black veterans, we saw the middle class um, expand with opportunities for the white middle class to expand um, through these public policies that were not um, supporting wealth building for black families and other families of color. In the 21st century, we saw predatory lending and subprime loans particularly target black and Latino borrowers. And so we saw black families and um, Latino families be much more likely to have high cost subprime loans uh, in the period of the Great Recession, where they were more likely to lose their homes through foreclosure and more likely uh, to lose greater amounts of wealth during the housing bust uh, after the Great Recession. So we are focused on wealth inequality and the racial wealth gap because we think it is really important that we understand uh, the importance of wealth for long-term security and also the fact that wealth inequality exceeds income inequality. So as you can see from this graphic, we still have substantial and prominent uh, inequality in terms of household income, but that really pales in comparison to the inequality we see in terms of wealth uh, between black and white households in New Jersey. And again, wealth provides a rainy day fund uh, when families do experience income volatility and also opportunities uh, to invest in the future for long-term security that income alone cannot. In our analysis, we also looked at the individual level racial wealth gap in New Jersey. Um, and as you can see from this graphic, uh, the individual level racial wealth gap is about $100,000 between uh, Black and Latino residents of the state um, and their white uh, peers. So in our report, we highlight the fact that policies in a number of areas got us to the racial wealth gap uh, that we see today. So there's several key building blocks of wealth that contribute to the racial wealth gap and policy areas where, that will help us understand both how we got to where we are today and um, how, what we can do to, to create more equity in these areas. So in our report, we talk about four key areas, housing and home ownership, work and benefits, unequal access to intergenerational wealth building assets, and our higher education system and how student loans are disproportionately weighing down black borrowers. So I'll talk about each one of these and happy to talk about them all in a little bit more detail during the question and answer. So first, housing and home ownership. We know that inequalities and inequities in home ownership are a major source of the racial wealth gap. Here in New Jersey, over three quarters of white families own their home compared to 38.4% of black families. And inequities in home ownership um, persist in both terms of rates of home ownership, who owns a home, which we see from these numbers here, as well as in terms of the returns to home ownership. So we see that even when black families are able to purchase a home, they don't experience the same wealth gains as white families due to the segregation we see today. Um, New Jersey, again, as Andrea noted, is one of the most segregated states in the nation. Uh, in addition, we see ongoing discrimination in housing appraisals um, for black families and in uh, communities of color. So one bill that we're uh, supporting to address this particular issue is a bill that would strengthen our protections against home appraisal discrimination. And so in New Jersey, because uh, the typical Black or Latino family is a renter, they don't have any home equity, whereas by comparison, the typical New Jersey family has about $130,000 uh, in home equity. In addition to the home appraisals bill, we're also supporting a bill that would help uh, first generation families purchase a home, folks whose parents did not own a home. Uh, purchase a home. So those types of down payment assistant programs um, are new and gaining uh, support nationally. It's something we'd like to see here in New Jersey as well. Next, in terms of work and benefits, I noted that income inequality, while important, is not as extreme as what we see in terms of wealth equality and inequality in the country. 
but still work and jobs, employment can be important sources of asset building for families. And after home ownership, uh, retirement benefits are the, the second uh, largest uh, overall source of wealth for families in the country. So as you can see from this graphic, retirement uh, inequities, inequities and who has any pension or retirement accounts are substantial in New Jersey. We need to expand access to retirement benefits and ensure that families of color in particular have access to retirement. We see that inequities and in access to quality jobs that help folks um, have stable incomes and benefits contributes to the racial wealth gap. So one policy that we are supporting is called the Fair Work Week Act that would help folks have more regular schedules and uh, more even incomes uh, across pay periods. And so that's one step that we think should be a part of a broader effort to ensure that jobs in New Jersey are quality jobs and that more folks have access to those quality jobs. Next, unequal access to intergenerational assets. The racial wealth gap itself can truly be reinforcing because wealth helps folks build wealth, whether it's a down payment on a home or a college um, access to college um, through parents who are able to pay for college. So because of the racial wealth gap that we have today that was built over generations uh, through our public policies, white youth are more likely to get a head start from their parents due to generational assets. So with their parents able to build wealth, they can then reinvest that wealth uh, into um, their, their kids who can then build wealth as adults. Um, so we see nationally one in 10 black families get an inheritance compared to about 25% of white families. And when white families do get an inheritance, it tends to be in larger amounts uh, than for black families. So one important um, policy that we're supporting in this area is the New Jersey Baby Bonds Program. I'm happy to talk about that in more detail in the Q&A, but we really think that um, baby bonds, which is a concept that's also being supported nationally um, and at the state level, uh, is something that we can do to help low wealth and low income newborns have a financial endowment um, from day one that they're uh, more wealthy peers already have. Connecticut was the first state to pass such a baby bond program last summer. Um, and we hope that New Jersey can be the second. Next, as I noted, um, higher education is really important, um, but the divestment in higher education that we've seen in recent decades has particularly hurt black borrowers. So the average New Jersey graduate leaves with over $33,000 in debt. Um, however, the black students tend to have more, more debt because of the racial wealth gap. They have higher need um, for higher education in terms of financial need. Um, and then they also have higher, um, greater difficulty paying off that debt over time because of both, the, again, the existing racial wealth gap and less ability of extended family to help pay for loans, um, as well as ongoing discrimination in the labor market. So here in New Jersey, our analysis shows that about um, among all adults above the age of 15, about 25% of Black New Jersey residents have some kind of educational loan compared to 16% of white individuals. So as highlighted previously, we did not get here um, by accident that these disparities were created by design and, uh, and by our public policies, and so must be the repair. So we want to proactively be proactive in our approach to redress the racially uh, and exclusionary policies that started with slavery, existed for generations, and led to the disparities that we see today. So as our campaign suggests, our Say the Word campaign says, suggests that we must say the word reparations in order to truly repair the harm of past policies that got us to where we are today in terms of the racial wealth gap. So as our reparations uh, say the word campaign is focused on establishing the New Jersey Reparations Task Force, um, which would create a task force to study uh, the role of slavery and systemic discrimination on our state and how it led to the, some of the disparities that we've highlighted uh, in this presentation today and that Andrea highlighted in her presentation earlier. So in conclusion, uh, in order to truly make the two New Jersey's one, we need to ensure that the prosperity of our state is truly inclusive and we must repair the harms of past policies. We must create new policies uh, which intentionally equalize opportunities to build wealth. And we must ensure that our current policies 
do not exacerbate wealth disparities and instead actively serve to close them. So thank you so much for listening. I'm so glad to uh, see you all here today and I'm happy to answer questions. Oops, sorry, my mic was done. I'm gonna go ahead and spotlight both of you here. We have a couple questions in the chat. I'm gonna start with one from Raymond Tyler. Um, Raymond says, as a reporter, I've reported on these problems, especially health uh, since before COVID and people have been discussing it before COVID. Is there a proposed timeline for a substantial meaningful change? Sure, I can answer this question because I love it. And I think that's exactly why it speaks the need for us to have a reparations task force, because we can't talk about the timeline moving forward without understanding how we've had a history of divestment dating back hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of years that we have to repair. Because as Laura said, when English settlers first came to the colony, they were given 150 acres of land and given an extra 150 acres for every enslaved African they brought in with them. We then had New Jersey, opposed the Emancipation Proclamation and the Reconstruction Amendments. We had an early form of sharecropping called cottaging take place after slavery. We had Black Americans returning from World War II being excluded from the GI Bill, racially restricted covenants. We had um, redlining, we had predatory lending, we had disproportionate foreclosures in Black communities. And so to, that's exactly why we need a reparations task force to address this history, to look at its length, to look at how decade after decade we had specific cases of divestment and come forward with policy proposals that are linked to time to say, how do we redress this harm moving forward? And so that's why I love that question because it speaks to exactly why we need reparations because, okay, we, we can't understand how long the solution will take until we understand how long the issue took to take hold here in the state. And we can also, while we're pushing for the reparations task force, do things to Laura's point immediately that will have uh, a time moving forward by when they will be implemented. We can have baby bonds coming behind Connecticut. We can look to student loan cancellation. We can close our youth prisons, which were announced to be closed four years ago. And so while we're pushing for this larger reparations work, which has to take into account our history, there are also things we can do in the interim to have change and an impact on the racial wealth gap today. Laura, do you want to add to that? Um, I think Andrea really covered it that, that we, you know, need to really understand where we've been in order to understand where we're going. Um, but we can also take a, a two pronged approach in terms of addressing some of the policy proposals that we have um, that we're supporting right now, as well as understanding uh, which ones may have a longer time horizon. I think the, as she noted, the reparations task force is, is designed to create a comprehensive look um, at where we need to go to truly close the racial wealth gap. But we're also uh, promoting some of the policies that I highlighted so that we can get started right away. Thank you. Uh, Jung Wan Lee of Yonhap News Agency has a question. Do you have the numbers or statistics regarding the wealth gap for AAPI groups in New Jersey? Uh, he says he believes some refugee groups from Asia have lower income, but he cannot find the number. Any information or data about AAPI, Asian American Pacific Islander organizations or groups? Yes, thank you so much for that question. Um, the national survey that we utilize, um, unfortunately, there's only a few sources of wealth data nationally, and this is the only one that can be analyzed at the state level. Um, it does have an um, information on uh, Asian Americans, but it doesn't have enough um, observations for us to make conclusive, um, provide conclusive results. Um, so I think that's a very important issue. Um, indeed, um, there is some studies nationally showing that the great disparity within the Asian American community um, show, shows quite an, a bit of uh, wealth disparity within the Asian American population. Um, and that's something um, that I know folks are looking at getting better localized data. So as folks who are working in the state of New Jersey, that is something that we would definitely support the um, Boston Federal Reserve is working uh, on under, uh, moving forward a project where they hope uh, to do some better state level analysis. And I hope uh, that we will see that work move forward and also be a model for other states. So um, unfortunately right now we, we can't um, provide any data on New Jersey in terms of the AAPI community, um, but we hope that that data will become more available and more broadly, um, we think it's really important that the state level data um, data collection uh, be increased at the state level. So we're um, pleased to see some efforts on that in other states. 
Thank you. Um, Andrew, do you want to add anything? Okay. No, oh, we're I at the half. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I was going to say we're at the halfway point, um, and I don't see any questions in the. Oh, here we go. Urdu News wants to know how much do you think the underserved communities know about all these issues that are mentioned in the report, and what role do you see those communities playing in fixing these problems? Sure, I can take that one. So I definitely think, in terms of the issues laid out in the report, underserved communities are living it, <laughs> they're being impacted by it. So, from that perspective, um, a big point within our overall theory of change is community engagement. And so we are now with this report after talking to community members and understanding the issues and then drafting um, this policy proposal driven report that Laura did are now making sure that we're doing public education. And so having conversations, having making sure the report is out there. And so we work with broad based coalitions as well um, to push forward each of our policies. And so kind of at every single touch point of any of our kind of campaigns focused around reports, we're engaging with community members. With our big reparations campaign, um, we encourage community members to go to 400yearsnj.org. We have our broad-based multi-faith uh, coalition pushing our Say the Word reparations campaign. And so whether it be campaigns, public education, community engagement, community members are definitely involved. But something that we would love to work with the press at every single moment to even get more um, information out there about this. So anyone can reach out to myself, reach out to Laura, reach out to our comms director, Lori Beecham, who's also on. If you're interested, we'll get make sure those PowerPoint slides are out to you. We know you have the link to the report. Again, our 400yearsnj.org, our action agenda. Um, we, we can use kind of all eyes as much as possible to make sure this information is out there and disseminated. Thank you. Uh, NJ Urban News wants to know, how can we do a better job at covering these issues in local black and brown owned media publications? It's a great question. Sure, I would say kind of echoing my previous comment, we'd love to talk with you. Um, <laughs> reach out to us so we can make sure that you are on our um, press list to make sure when we ever have any press releases or anything like that, you're first to, to get to it. Um, my email address is a mchristian at njio. Joe said he'll provide the email addresses. Yeah, we'll um, make sure that's in the follow-up email too, folks. So don't worry about that, but yes. Yeah, so just stay in close contact with us. If there's any kind of issue you see and you want to reach out, we can also make sure we're just having that communication because that's the best That's the best outlet, to your point, to reach um, at the local level Black and Brown community. So we'd love to be connected and hope this is the start um, of that conversation moving forward. Also, just talking to people in the community that you know may be interested, you can tell them to reach out to the Institute um, and we can get them looped into some of our campaigns so that we can be connected in that way as well. And the follow-up to Jungwon Lee's question by Jeff Pierce uh, wants to know, what does engagement by communities mean? What does community engagement mean besides simply learning about the history and the current initiatives? Sure, so within our theory of change, we go to community members to understand what issues are presenting within their communities. I'll, I'll mention um, our 1844 No More campaign, for example. Um, what we were finding was that a number of people who had criminal convictions were not able to vote in New Jersey. And obviously the vote is a fundamental right um, that impacts our democracy so fulsomely. And so through that, we were able to launch a campaign um, the 1844 No More campaign, named for the year that New Jersey first restricted the right to vote um, to, to white people, as well as denied it to people with criminal convictions. And as part of that overall campaign, we have had impacted people lead the way. They've testified, they've rallied people, they've talked to legislators, and that was the tool that was ultimately successful in getting uh, the legislation passed that restored the right to vote to 83,000 people on probation and parole in the state. And so we don't just tell community members, hey, here's our report, um, read it and, and go along your mighty way. We make sure that they are looped into every point of the process and leading um, the campaigns and the efforts that ultimately impact them. Um, okay, I got two. I got a question here from Urgent News, but real quick, um, you've mentioned theory of change twice or, or three times before, and I wonder for those who aren't, um, you know, well versed in the sort of uh, nonprofit world, I guess, um, can you just briefly go over what you what you understand theory of change to mean? I've tried to look for it on the website, but I, I, I'll let you just explain it. Sure, I actually had theory of change slide, but I cut it for time. <laughs> um, so we have a multifaceted theory of change that drives our body of work that drives our campaigns, that drives our advocacy. So first to understand um, an issue, we go to the community. 
who tells us, okay, I'm, I'm feeling this, I'm, I'm kicked out of my house, the rent is too high, my young, per my youth or my kid is in youth incarceration, I want them to get out, the police keep, you know, harassing me whenever I leave my home. From there, we research the report thoroughly, understanding its history nationally and in New Jersey, and draft policy-driven reports that say, okay, here's the issue, here's the cause of the issue, here's some proposed solutions to, to remedy that issue. We then do public education where we're doing this. So we're going out, we're talking about the reports, we're getting people kind of interested in, in the work um, and what we're trying to do. And then we build campaigns where we have broad, multi-faith, very diverse campaigns to advance um, systems change around this issue, whether that is legislated, passage of legislation, whether that's executive orders coming out of the governor's office, whether that's the attorney general issuing directives, all responsive to the problem we address. And on the other side of that systems change, we look to implementation, which is making sure that people in the community actually can experience the change that we advocated for so that it comes full circle where a problem was addressed and a problem is solved. And so that's kind of our theory of change in a nutshell that drives our work to make sure we're proximate to the community. Awesome, thank you. I know just our own, my own experience at the center, we spent months and months and months trying to articulate and, and fine tune our theory of change. And it was a, as a head spinner sometimes just to make sure we get it down. Uh, I got one question from Urdu News. Who would you hold responsible for the racial disparities and the racial wealth gap if you were to enact the solutions that you've outlined in the report? What does that accountability look like, I guess is the... Uh, Laura, do you want to go? I feel I've been talking a lot. <laughs> sure, yeah, I'm happy to. So I think, you know, our report really highlights that the public policies got us to where we are today. And so we need public policies to help us create a more equitable New Jersey to, to make the two New Jerseys one. So, um, you know, as we highlighted the some of the policies that got us to where we are today from uh, our, the foundation of our state with slavery to redlining to racially restrictive covenants, um, to um, predatory lending more recently. All of these discriminatory policies were built into the foundation of our state. Um, and so we need to understand them uh, through the reparations task force, and then we need to address them directly. So we see it as a multi-pronged approach in these different issue areas that we've identified, um, but that it really needs to be a, um, systemic undertaking to change our public policies so that we are promoting equity through our policies as opposed to what we've done for generations, which is create this racial wealth gap. Okay, uh, I got one from NJ Urban News says, I'm, oh, chat's moving. I'm also a public employee and I work with offenders. The probation department assists offenders in, to apply to vote, but it's difficult without their ID or addresses uh, and primary concern for employment. Do you have any suggestions? We would actually love to hear from you. Um, please send us the email because that speaks to implementation. We were very excited to work with probation and parole to make sure to your point, um, people coming out of incarceration were aware of their rights and this is the implementation phase. And so we have um, a race council that we work with as an institute-based council of formerly incarcerated people that are looking directly to one implementation of the law and advancing the restoration of the right to vote to incarcerated people as well. And so they, we need to be aware of what issues are being presented that might hinder people from engaging in their right to vote. So please shoot us an email um, so we can try and troubleshoot that. Thanks so much for raising it. Fantastic. Uh, Anne wants to know if you can detail, provide more detail on juvenile justice, which cities, what's a project timeline look like and are any of the results that you have to share at this time? Sure, so I'll talk first about the campaign, the 150 Years is Enough campaign, and then the restorative justice pilot. So um, in 2017, the Institute and Partners launched our 150 Years is Enough campaign on the 150th year anniversary of Jamesburg, the state's largest youth prison for boys. We launched the campaign because as I mentioned, we have the worst black to white youth incarceration disparity rate in the nation with the black youth 18 times more like, almost 18 times more likely to be locked up than a white youth. We're incarcerating our youth at a cost of almost half a million dollars um, each year for each young person, which totals about $50 million um, each year uh, to incarcerate about 100 young people 
in youth prisons that are about 75% empty with about 500 workers. And so we think that the current system as it is, in which young people, about a quarter of them are ending up back within these facilities within three years, is, is perpetuating harmful racial disparities, is exorbitantly wasteful and is not rehabilitating our young people. And so we launched a campaign to advocate for a better way. A few months after that, former Governor Chris Christie announced the closure of two of New Jersey's youth prisons, but four years later, they're all still open. And so on our campaign on one arm, we are still working diligently with a focus on this year, having New Jersey's AG set a timeline for closing those three facilities. But the second half of the campaign is to reinvest meaningfully into communities. And so that came in our rapid response to COVID-19 with those three items I listed before, which ended with the restorative justice hubs pilot in Patterson, Trenton, Camden, and Newark, which allocated $8.4 million for the development of hubs with enhanced reentry services in those four cities. It's a two-year pilot. They're currently in the phase of finalizing regulations because it just got passed um, last August. And so please go to the JJC website where they should be posting how you can find out more about um, submitting an RFP um, and different measures like that. But we're very excited kind of as the pilot progresses to see kind of successes, what things need to be strengthened so that we can expand the pilot statewide. Fantastic. Okay, what's next? Here we go. This chat keeps moving on me. Okay, uh, how do the baby bonds work? Jeff Pierce wants to know, would they be restricted based on family income? Thank you um, for that question. So the, as I noted earlier, there's sort of a national push for baby bonds and that has been led by Senator Cory Booker and then different states are um, taking the lead in this issue and trying to create a baby bonds program um, for their particular state. So New Jersey was actually the first state to introduce uh, um, legislation on the baby bonds after uh, in the summer of 2020, uh, Governor Murphy announced support for baby bonds. Then that fall, um, our legislation was introduced. We are currently working with the legislators uh, to make that bill as strong as possible in part following the model of Connecticut. So um, there, there's a bill here in, in New Jersey, the amount uh, currently in the, the current pending legislation would be at uh, $2,000 um, per child at birth. Um, and that would, eligibility would be based on 200% uh, uh, or below of the poverty line. Uh, in Connecticut, the amount is somewhat larger. It's $3,200, um, which they estimate to go up to about over $10,000 by the time uh, the child becomes 18 years old. So, um, the basically nationally different folks are, are doing different things around design. Um, here in New Jersey, we are working with the legislators uh, to make it as strong as possible to make the bond as much as possible to create sustainable funding for that program and to um, ensure that, it, that the bond amount is as substantial as, as we can so that it's a truly robust endowment for youth. Okay. Um, I don't see any more questions in the chat, but I had one actually. I, I wonder if you could talk about what you think would be, what, what you hope the reparations task force would look like in terms of the organizational or individual makeup. Um, what kind of organizations would you like to see on it? Um, what kind of, of missions or goals or objectives uh, would you see short term or at least medium term? Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? I just, as, as terms of the, 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 what does that look like? Sure. I mean, and Joe, I think that's a great question because that's, all spelled out in the legislation. So if okay, everyone sorry. goes to, yeah, it's a very thorough uh, legislation. So if you look at the bill numbers are A938, S386, it says who representatives would be, including representatives from um, Black-led civil rights organizations, um, experts, uh, nationally legislators. It will meet, it'll have a two-year term um, with an interim report halfway through. It will engage in public hearings throughout the state to gain from people who have been impacted by, by New Jersey's generational divestment to testify um, so that the uh, task force can take that into account. And so it, you know, we're very excited to see kind of what's going on in California. We had the first, we were the first state to issue legislation. Unfortunately, California surpassed us, but they're actually actively engaging in the hearings um, right now. They just had a meeting to talk about kind of what the beneficiary system would look like. And so we think that, you know, based on the, the comprehensive 
nature of what uh, the task force would spell out in our state, including slavery, including its history of discrimination, including how that implicates health, education, the racial wealth gap, a number of different issue areas that we have a lot to dig into um, here in the state, but encourage everyone, thank you so much for dropping them to the chat to look at what the task force specifically um, is going to look like. Fantastic. I don't see any more questions in the chat. Does anybody want to just raise their hand and I can unmute you or you can unmute and ask a question out loud. We do have about 10 to 15 minutes. I want to try to get you out of here about five minutes early, but we can go to the full top of the hour. But if anybody wants to just unmute themselves now, I'll put you up on the stage here and you can ask your question or just make a comment or anything. We still have, like I said, about 10, 15 minutes left. If not, we can end early, but um, you know, this is your time. Okay, I can play the Jeopardy theme if we have to, but um, thank you all both so much, uh, all three of you actually, because we have Laurie Beecham here in the chat has been helping out as well. I appreciate uh, all of you doing this. Um, I'll give it one last call, drop it in the chat or unmute yourself and just start talking. Um, but if, if not, then I'm going to go ahead and, um, and thank our speakers. I uh, appreciate it. I really, I'm about halfway through the report. Um, I haven't been able to make it all the way through, but uh, it's a dense one. Um, and there's a lot to unpack in there. I will be sending out all, all this materials, including links to the report, the executive summary, the action agenda. I'm going to make sure I include the links to the bills as well as the information to, oh, what, what we got, Ann. Okay, cool. Love it. Ann, you want to go ahead and uh, unmute yourself and then go ahead yes, and ask your question? Thank you so much. Um, I had a question, uh, speaking as a Board of Ed member, I'm wondering if you looked at the financial literacy um, guidelines and curriculum that are required of our students to see what can be done to help um, address the, the wealth disparity gap um, at that level. Thank you for that question. We actually, I didn't have a chance to mention it because um, indeed we have um, a number of policy proposals. I highlighted sort of the, the largest ones. Um, that we're promoting actively right now. However, we do also mention uh, the importance of uh, improving and increasing uh, financial literacy and financial empowerment programs. So we do highlight um, a bill A1296, um, which would ensure that the current um, requirements for high school students include um, information on, on financial aid and student loans so that folks um, in high school are getting that information before they, they take on those loans. So um, broadly, we in the report highlight the fact that, um, you know, the racial wealth gap was created by these broader systemic issues, but if folks can be empowered uh, as well to make better decisions, then that is something that we would support uh, through uh, increased financial literacy and empowerment programs. So, um, that's that one bill that I highlighted is um, is one that we're working towards, but I think that that's a, a broader area that that we think has opportunities uh, for folks to look into um, and more additional policy proposals um, to engage in. And we highlight actually a bill that was was passed recently uh, that's uh, for adults uh, to increase uh, financial empowerment as well. Fantastic. And is that uh, is that good? You had any other follow up? No, that's great. Thank you. I may email them later. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, I'm putting together the follow up email right now. And as I was saying earlier, uh, I'll be including a link to the recording, a link to an auto generated transcript that Otter produces for us uh, that that all allow you to like click on or search for words and play the audio right from that point. Uh, we also going to send around the chat log and an audio only version and the slide link, which I'll get from uh, Andrea and Laura shortly after this. Uh, um, I'll also include the contact information, the emails, uh, presuming that it's all that's okay by you all you've all indicated that you'd like people to reach out. Um, and then I encourage anybody to share any of the links to the reporting that they do based on this. So uh, we'd love to help uh, share and promote the work that you all are doing around this uh, as well. So um, with that, I don't see any more questions. I'll let everybody go. Thank you, Dorothy uh, has uh, their email in the chat as well. Uh, thanks folks. And we'll see you next time. Uh, I'll let you all know. I'll add you to make sure that you get notifications when we have another press briefing. We do these all the time for New Jersey News Commons members and uh, New Jersey reporters uh, who don't often have access to experts like this. So keep an eye out for that and uh, have a great week. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.